this recording we will discuss cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle uh, exhibits autorhythmicity, which is kind of a hard word to say, but it means that your cardiac muscle sets its own rhythm without input from your nervous system, which is kind of amazing. We think of our brain kind of controlling everything, but your cardiac muscle has the ability to contract without the input uh, from your nervous system. Now, just like any other type of muscle, cardiac muscle contracts in response to action potentials. Um, but unlike skeletal and many smooth muscle cells, your cardiac muscle cells do not require stimulation from your nervous system to generate those action potentials. So if you remember the neuromuscular junction um, that was discussed in the skeletal muscle chapter, um, you had a nerve impulse coming from your brain um, and you would have a synapse between the nerve and the skeletal muscle itself. We would release a subtle choline, it would trigger an action potential on the muscle fiber itself and we would get skeletal muscle contraction. Um, the cardiac muscle doesn't really need any of that to happen um, as far as the nervous system input goes. So cardiac activity, um, it's coordinated. So if you think about how your heart beats, your atria contract simultaneously and then your ventricles contract simultaneously. Um, we need nice coordinated muscle contraction. We don't want your ventricles contracting before your atria. We don't want um, your left ventricle but your right atria to contract at the same time. There's a very specific way that we need everything to happen. Um, and one of the ways that we achieve that is through pacemaker cells. Um, and these are kind of special. Pacemaker cells, they basically do what their name implies. They set the pace for uh, muscle contraction in your heart. You also have another type of cell that makes up your heart. We have um, contractile cells as well. Um, the pacemaker cells are going to quote unquote set the pace of the heart contraction, but the contractile cells are going to be the ones that are actually doing the contraction. It should make sense to you that we have quite a few more contractile cells compared to pacemaker cells. In fact, approximately 99% of your cardiac cells are the contractile cells themselves. Just as a refresher, cardiac muscle cells, um, they are striated. They do tend to branch um, as opposed to skeletal muscle fibers. They are shorter and wider than skeletal muscle fibers as well. Cardiac muscle cells do contain a good amount of myoglobin. Um, you may have, be familiar with the cousin to myoglobin um, known as hemoglobin. So myoglobin carries oxygen within uh, muscles specifically. So myo um, means muscle. Nearly half of the volume within a cardiac muscle cell is full of mitochondria. And hopefully you remember that mitochondria function um, through cellular respiration to produce ATP, our favorite source of energy. So if we have that many, mitochondria, it should lend itself to make sense that we just need that much energy. Um, that should also make sense because your heart literally doesn't stop beating until you die. We are constantly in need of ATP. Cardiac muscle cells do have a unique structure known as intercalated discs. This is how you join one cardiac muscle cell to the adjacent cell. Um, these also join pacemaker cells to the contractile cells, not just the contractile cells to one another. Um, these intercalated discs contain both desmosomes, which help hold the adjacent cells together, um, but they also contain gap junctions, which allow ions to pass rapidly between the cells, which allows for rapid communication among your cardiac muscle cells. Again, our whole goal is um, synchronicity. Remember, we want our um, heart to beat in a very specific way. 
just a brief overview of what a cardiac muscle cell looks like, or muscle fibers, plural, because we have a couple here. You can see that big old nucleus, everybody's familiar with that. We can see our intercalated disc here, and we blew it up. We've got desmosomes that are holding one cell to the adjacent cell, and then we've also got these gap junctions here that are allowing for rapid ion transport for communication. Um, we've got the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the T-tubules, the sarcolemma, those terms should be familiar from the skeletal muscle system. We've still got I-bands and A-bands that provide for the striations. And then you can see those quite a few mitochondria in here to produce the amount of ATP required for um, sustained contraction. Now, those pacemaker cells that we mentioned, um, their job is rhythmic, spontaneous depolarizations that lead to action potential. And that's a lot of nice words there. Rhythmic, spontaneous depolarizations. Um, those action potentials, once they start, they're going to quickly spread um, through the cardiac conduction system okay, um, until they make their way to the contractile cells so we can get the rhythmic um, contractions that we are familiar with, that good old love dub that has been with us our entire lives. So your cardiac conduction system um, is coming up, but let's review just real quick good old action potentials. So cardiac muscle action potentials work just a tiny bit different than skeletal muscle contraction. There's something that's going to happen here that we did not see when we learned about skeletal muscle contraction way back in the day. So the first step is the same. Rapid depolarization, um, and we do this through opening voltage-gated sodium channels. So a bunch of your extracellular sodium is going to rush inside of your cardiac cells. And you will see our membrane potential goes from about a negative 85, it jumps up to about a positive 20. That part should sound pretty familiar. Next we have the initial repolarization phase. So your sodium channels are inactivated, so we have closed those. You'll notice no more sodium is rushing into the cell. And we start to open some of our potassium channels, okay? Some of our potassium from um, our intracellular fluid is going to escape into our extracellular fluid. And notice we are starting to slightly work our way back down toward resting membrane potential. So this pr probably nothing really standing out quite yet. And then we get here. Ooh, this is different, okay? Um, now we have a plateau phase. Okay, this plateau phase is something that we did not see in skeletal muscle contraction. This is unique to cardiac muscle. So we have a third channel, calcium. Ooh, calcium channels. Okay, so notice that our sodium channel is still inactivated, still closed, there's no sodium moving. We've only got a few potassium channels that are open. And notice the direction of the potassium, so we're moving from inside to outside the cell. And then we're going to open these calcium channels. Okay. Calcium also has a positive charge, okay, just like potassium does. And notice which way these calciums are moving. These are going from extracellular fluid to intracellular fluid, okay. So here's what happens. Calcium channels open and calcium enters as potassium exits. This prolongs the depolarization phase, okay. So notice it's taking us a lot longer to get back to resting membrane potential than it did compared to skeletal muscles. Um, our last step um, is the sodium and potassium channels. Everybody's finally closed. The potassium channels, they have finally all opened. We start to really see repolarization. Eventually these will also close as well once we hit resting membrane potential. And then we can start the whole process over again. We can do depolarization yet again by opening up those sodium channels that we're familiar with. So why are we, this is weird, right? This is different. Why are we um, extending or prolonging depolarization? What is the purpose of that? Um, so even though the picture is somewhat similar um, for cardiac and skeletal muscle, there, there is a big difference, and that's that plateau phase that we just talked about. So here's what the purpose is, all right? And this is pretty well written. If cardiac action potentials lasted only about one to five seconds, like 
your skeletal muscles. Okay? Your resting heart rate would be about 15 times faster than it should be at rest. Okay? Um, we don't need your heart to work that fast. This is a resting heart rate. Okay? So normally our resting heart rate should be on average 70 to 75 beats per minute. Um, we don't want it to be 15 times 70 beats per minute. Your poor little heart would just explode. So this plateau phase lengthens the time it takes to complete a legitimate action potential, a full action potential, which slows your heart rate. This also, okay, put a star by this as well, provides time to make sure your heart is filling with blood before it pumps again, okay? So what's the whole point in doing cardiac muscle contraction? It's to pump blood. If you are just pumping your heart so fast that there's no time for blood to actually get in the heart, or at least not an adequate amount of blood, then you're really not doing yourself any good. This also, one last bullet point, increases the strength of the heart's contraction. So the longer it takes to complete an action potential, okay, the twitch, the muscle twitch lasts a longer time and it can develop more force. Okay, so we're slowing down so our heart doesn't beat out of our chest. We're slowing down to make sure the heart has enough time to fill up with blood and we're slowing down so we can pump with a stronger force when we do complete our action potential. This recording is going to discuss cardiac conduction and EKGs. Your cardiac conduction system is composed of certain populations of pacemaker cells. Now we've mentioned pacemaker cells previously, and we've even mentioned the cardiac conduction system. So we're just gonna go into a little bit more detail here. The three specific populations of pacemaker cells that you are want, going to want to familiarize yourselves with, you've got your sinoatrial node or your SA node. You've got your atrioventricular node or your AV node. And then we have a couple of other things. We've got Purkinje fiber system, which includes atrioventricular bundles, right and left bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers themselves. Okay. So we start with your good old SA node. This is your fastest intrinsic rate of depolarization. Okay. This beats, or I shouldn't say this beats, these fire at about 60 or more times per minute. Okay. So about 60 or more times per minute. So we've talked about how your cardiac system doesn't necessarily need direct input from your nervous system to send those action potentials to continue your heart um, to generate muscle contractions. But your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system do influence how quickly your heart beats. Okay, so your SA node fires at about 40 times a minute and then your sympathetic or your parasympathetic determines should we increase this or should we decrease this? And it really is dependent upon your current situation. If you are currently exercising, your sympathetic nervous system is gonna take over. It's like, okay, 60 beats per minute is not gonna do it. We are you know, running sprints in gym class. We need to set, step up the pace. Um, if, it, if you're laying in bed at night and it's time to go to sleep, your parasympathetic system's gonna be like, okay, let's bring that back down, maybe get to that 60 to 70 beats per minute. It's time to go to sleep. We don't need to um, be pumping quite as vigorously as we were when it was time to do our sprints. Now, next comes your AV node. This is slower than the SA node firing rate. This is only approximately 40. Um, potentials per minute. Okay, and if I keep saying beats per minute, please excuse me, these are really action potentials per minute. So you'll fire 40 action potentials per minute um, from your AV node. And then the signal has to spread to your Purkinje fiber system. These cells depolarize only about 20 times per minute. Okay, so from the AV node, we hit the AV bundle. 
Okay. Then we branch into the left and right bundle branches and we come up and we penetrate the sides of the ventricles in the Purkinje fibers to um, get contraction in the ventricles themselves. So we've got a lot of words. Let's look at a pretty picture. So we've got our SA node way up in the top of your right atrium. Okay. This is, remember, this is our pacemaker. Okay. We're going to start our quickest here. We're going to send at least our 60 extrapotentials per minute. And all of these yellow fibers are conducting those action potentials to the next person. Notice that we also have to send the signals to your left atrium. Okay. So we start in our SA node. This causes atrial contraction. While that's happening, that signal has spread to your AV node. From your AV node, we go down to your AV bundle. And then we branch off into your bundle branches, your left and your right. These curve around and penetrate the rest of the ventricles on both sides. Okay, these are your Purkinje fibers. These are the small ones. Okay. So your SA node generates your action potential. While that's spreading and we have atrial contraction, we move on to our AV node. Um, there is a little bit of a delay there. It takes a little bit of time to go to spread through both of the atria to hit the AV node and then go down the bundle branches and hit the Purkinje fibers. Um, so there is that delay as well. Remember, when the atria are contracting, what are the ventricles doing? They're waiting their turn. Okay, so we wanna make sure that the atria finish contracting before the ventricles begin. So that's another purpose of this delay that we're mentioning. Um, but last but not least, after we work our way through our branches, we're gonna loop around to each side and hit our Purkinje fibers and then we can get ventricle, ventricular contraction. Okay. Now we mentioned that normal heart rate was approximately 70 to 75 beats per minute, um, but that really is just an approximation. Everybody's a little bit different. Normal heart rate can range anywhere from about 60 to 100 beats per minute. <coughs> um, if you get above 100 beats per minute, you are currently suffering from what we call tachycardia, which is just a really fast heart rate. Um, sometimes this is I don't want to say perfectly normal, but there are easy to understand reasons, like elevated body temperature, okay? So when you work out, you get hot, um, your, your heart starts pumping faster, things like that. Stress, if you get really stressed out, if your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, your heart rate's going to go up. But then you have other things, certain drugs, um, both legal and um, less legal. And then heart disease can also cause your heart to have to um, pump faster as well. Um, any of these can cause this tachycardia. Now, this is not something that we want to continue regularly. So if it's just elevated body temperature, eventually we're going to stop working out or you know, if we're just outside, it's really hot, we're eventually gonna come inside. So that one's kind of easy to deal with. But some of the rest of these are a little bit harder. So there are certain medications for example, digitalis, pilocarpine, beta blockers, alpha blockers, all of these are designed to, in their own different way, uh, lower your heart rate. Some of these um, also work on your blood pressure, but they do have an effect on your heart rate as well. Um, sinus tachycardia is just a regular fast rhythm, um, and if it gets too bad, again, your doctor may prescribe you um, some sort of medical treatment. Now we have the flip side of the coin, bradycardia is an abnormally slow heart rate, so anything below 60 beats per minute. Um, we have some, some things, again, that are going to be very familiar to us. A lower body temperature, so when we get really cold, we want to conserve heat, um, so everything in our body just kind of slows down. Again, certain drugs, and then your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, your parasympathetic nervous system, it's literally um, the job of the parasympathetic system to um, rest and digest, right? So we're going to slow that heart rate down. If we stay too low for too long, we can throw a few things in the mix to try to fix that. Uh, atropine, we might need to give you a pacemaker. Perhaps something has happened to your SA node and it no longer functions properly. Or even perhaps thyroid medications. Okay, Any of these will increase that heart rate back up to normal. 
Now, your autonomic nervous system, we've kind of mentioned it a couple of times here and there. Let's make sure we are really specific on what is happening. So your autonomic nervous system does help you control your heart rate. It's just an external source of control. Remember those um, pacemaker cells and those contractile cells really can kind of function all by themselves. Your autonomic nervous system is just that extra layer of control. Specifically, your cardiac center within your cardiovascular center of your medulla oblongata, which is my like favorite part of the whole brain. Um, so your medulla oblongata, or just a lot of times we'll just say your medulla or your medulla, however you prefer to pronounce it. So if your heart rate's too slow, if we're doing that bradycardia, um, your sympathetic system, your fight or flight, is going to want to send extra signals to your SA node. Those signals are going to come from epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, from your good old adrenal glands. These are going to increase your heart rate. On the other hand, if our heart's beating a little too fast, your parasympathetic division of your nervous system will decrease your heart rate, but in a different way. So now we're going to stimulate your vagus nerve, which will release acetylcholine, and this will decrease your heart rate back to normal. Your parasympathetic is actually your dominant system for your heart rate. Because again, we do not want our heart to overwork itself on a regular basis. We really only want to increase our heart rate for very specific reasons. Again, perhaps you're exercising, something like that.